So the last thing I want to tackle are a couple word problems because that seems to be a big part of the application bit of IB um, that they seem to like, right? They don't like that dry, just do the steps, get the answer. They want you to think about it. So let's think about it. So Ashley started working in 2000. Each year she received a salary increase equal to 1.15% of her previous year's salary. And in 2011, her salary was $51,250 and we want to find her starting salary. Let's pull out what we know. Pull out what we're given. Well, we know that she started working in 2000. We know that her salary increases 1.1 uh, sorry, 1.15% each year. We know that in 2011, she made $51,250. Determine her starting salary to the nearest dollar. So our goal is to find the salary in 2000. Well, when we see this percent increase, then we know we're talking about a geometric series, or sequence rather. And because it's increasing 1.15%, then I could say that each, if for year n, if I call it n year, right? then the n plus one, the next year's salary is the salary for year n times 1.0115, right? This is the 1.1%. 1 1 plus that percent because my salary is growing. We call it exponential growth. If my salary were to decrease, I should get another job, but we would call this decay, and I would take one minus the percent. But because I'm taking the percent and adding it to my existing amount, we have one plus the percent because it's growing. So let's see if we can represent this using a geometric sequence because I've kind of identified that we're gonna need one. UN, her salary in year N, and we want N equal to one to represent the year 2000. So I want to be careful here with that type of notation. So un is u1 times r to the n minus 1. And let's see, we don't know her starting salary. But we do know the common ratio, which is point zero, sorry, 1.0115. We have something that looks like a general term. Well, we have more information. We have what we'd call an initial condition in other branches of math, and it functions kind of similarly. We know that in 2011, her salary was 51,250. So if the year 2000 is represented by n equal to one, the year 2011 is gonna be represented by n equals 12, So I know that u sub 12 is equal to 51,250. Well, I can also represent that by u1 times the common ratio, n is 12, so 12 minus one is 11. I can kind of combine these now, right? I can combine these two statements to say that $51,250, u1 was made by say, taking the base salary and multiplying by the common ratio 11 times. So let's figure out what that is. That's gonna be about 1.134. I'm gonna go out a few more decimal places than I need just to minimize rounding error. And then my last step would be to divide. And my starting salary is gonna be 45,192. Uh, we were told to the nearest dollar. So it says 0.78, which means I need to round that up to 45,193 dollars. Labels are important. So 45,193, that's the starting salary. So that's exponential growth and decay, right? The key for exponential growth and decay was this bit right here. Compound interest. I don't like the way the book does it. The book tries to do it in that geometric series way. Let's just stick with the formula that we know and that we might have learned. I know that the compound interest or a compound interest account can be represented by this formula right here. 
and it's not the type of formula that you will see in the formula booklet, booklet. I'm going to tell you that right now, but it's what's commonly taught when we learn about compound interest. So that's given here. And A is my account balance. P is my principal. R is my interest rate as a decimal. N is a little special. N is the number of times interest is calculated per year. And then T is time in years. So let's dive into the account. This is going to be a little bit more complicated than just using the formula, but that's okay. Luke deposits $1,500 into an account earning 2.5% interest compounded monthly. He makes no other deposits for two years and then withdraws the balance of the account and deposits it into a new account earning 3.25% compounded annually. If your, head, if your brain is like mine, your head is spinning. Before we go on to that second account, let's just deal with what's going on in this first account. There's, there's a lot happening here, right? So account one. $1,500 was put in. We have a 2.5% interest rate. Compounded monthly. And he keeps that for two years. This is a crucial step when, when the problem seems overwhelming. Pull that important information right out of the paragraph. So after those two years, he withdraws the balance of the account and deposits it into a new account. And that account earns 3.25% compounded annually. He leaves that money in the account for three years. All right, stop again. Let's figure out what's going on in account two. He takes whatever the balance of the account was. but it earns 3.25% interest and it's compounded annually for three years. I wanna know what he's got in the account after five years. Before we tackle the second half of that question, let's deal with what we've got first. Let's do account one first. After, for account one, We'll stick with my formula. He takes $1,500, that's my principal, it's my starting amount. With an interest rate of 2.5% compounded monthly. So if something is compounded monthly, it happens 12 times a year. If something happens monthly, it happens 12 times a year, so N is 12. And then he keeps that for two years. So this one is just Plug it in and get the answer, right? 1,500 times 1 plus 0 0.025 divided by 12 to the 12 times 2. And I get 1,576.82. It's money. We want to round it as money. Well, in part, in account 2, he takes the balance of account 1. So this now becomes the new principal. So in account two, it's still compound interest. And now we have an interest rate of 3.25% compounded annually, right? Things that happen annually happen once a year, right? Your birthday is annual. It happens once a year for three years. So T is three. And again, this is actually a little more straightforward than maybe I thought, right? It's, it really is just ultimately plugging in into the formula. Um, you just have to read carefully to know what's going on and what to plug in where, because like I said earlier, that paragraph is dense. That paragraph is overwhelming and that's okay, but we can't panic. We have to take a step back and we really have to think about um, what they're trying to give us and what they're asking us to do. So at the end of the five years, this is his account balance. Seventeen thirty-five sixty-one. And I want to know how much in interest did Luke earn? Well, interest is a 
added onto the principal of an account. Right? If you have a savings account, it earns interest. So your account balance is not just the money you put in. Right? Your account balance is part principal, that's the money you put in, but it's also part interest, the money that the bank gives you, um, more or less for you using their bank, but it's also so they can use your money, and that's, that's a question for another time, that's a discussion for another time. Um, so it's part principal, part interest. Well, we want to know just how much an interest that Luke earned. So we're concerned with finding just this interest. So this is my entire account. Well, from this convenient little pie chart, right? Account balance is principal plus interest. So my 1735.61 is, I started with $1,500 and along the way, I added on some amount of money. Well, that some amount of money happens to be 235.61 dollars. Labels are important. 